I'd like to welcome everybody today uh, who, are, who are participating here in the great space um, at the School of Architecture and those of you participating from remote locations. Uh, just for your benefit, um, just ask a couple of housekeeping rules here is that if, um, if you're not talking, try to stay muted because um, the, the, the Zoom space gets reasonably active uh, as we go through it. Um, if you want to raise a hand, um, you can try that. Uh, don't, feel, don't feel shy about just uh, speaking. That, that sometimes the raising hand thing doesn't always work because we don't see the hand raised on the, on the screen. So just to keep that in mind. Um, there's a link that I sent to all of the reviewers to a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet is helpful to you because it looks just like this. And you got here probably by using that link. Um, and in that, there are, for each uh, thesis candidate, um, there are PDFs, um, and the PDFs represent the entire wall that is flanking this thesis presentation. It takes a little bit of time to upload. So this is Mariam's thesis presentation. We'll see Mariam in just a second. I'll introduce her and her committee. Um, and uh, that may help you contemplate as we go through the project. It may help you to return uh, to various aspects of the project uh, that you have a question for. Uh, obviously, for those of us here in the room, we can walk up and point to something or ask a question and so forth. Because this is a hybrid format for the folks in the room, if you um, want to ask a question, uh, just sort of signal me. I'll come up with the microphone. It's absolutely essential. And then Miriam and each of the presenters will repeat the question back because the folks at home may or may not hear what the question is, because this is not linked to the microphone up here. There is the Zoom microphone. We're working through the technologies at the moment. Perhaps those of you that are joining us from afar can help us uh, out, particularly those of you in big offices that know how to, how to deal with it. Anyhow, I want to, before we begin, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Fabian Gomez and Kenny Noyan of PSC, our, our uh, technology group here uh, at the School of Architecture. I want to thank them for their incredible dedication in making this whole thing work. Um, today, we will see this morning three students uh, listed in front of you, uh, Marion, Jocelyn, and then Bobby. And I'd just like to quickly introduce our, um, uh, our uh, guests today, John Pontellis, who's an architect in New York. Uh, John is uh, with uh, H3, uh, uh, the successor firm to the Hugh Hardy firm, uh, and Sonhee Kim, who is with Design Collective uh, and uh, an alumna of the program, and Yonji Ko, who is a faculty member uh, and a year chair at the uh, uh, Boston Architectural College, and Irina Savakova, also a director of design uh, for Leo Daly Associates here in Washington, D.C., um, and an alumna of the program as well. So I'm going to stop screen sharing for one second. I'm going to get Miriam set up here. Miriam's committee is comprised of Ronit Eisenbach, uh, of uh, Lindsay May, and, and myself. And what we're going to do is share Miriam's presentation. And we're going to introduce Miriam here to take us to Gallaudet University here in Washington, D.C. And as this loads, there we go. Marion, come on over here. I'll show you just really quickly. All you have to do is point at that arrow to advance and point at that arrow to go back. You can use the pointer to do that, OK? And introduce yourself, and you're all ready to go. You have to click it. We're all ready to go. Good luck. Break away. Hi there, Dr. Brown. Um, first of all, I'm going to take a look at a gangster of sight. Uh, I went to Cannes to look at your computer today. And before I begin my presentation, uh, I would like to thank the Academy of the Cannes members for uh, their support to my research. Thank you 
Okay, thank you. Uh, to discuss my work. Is it good? good. Okay. Um, I will be grateful to her uh, forever. Uh, I'm also indebted to Professor Brian Kelly um, for his insight and trust in me. Trusting um, in me, uh, his help in connecting me to resources at Washington at Gallaudet and uh, information uh, for from for Washington DC uh, was instrumental in my project. I want also sincerely thank Mr. Alec at Grid Architects for his uh, pr uh, priceless tips and input. Let me play yeah. a video video for you. I was just I was just gonna say if you can change it out of um, the mode where we're seeing your slides and into presenter view. We because right now we see all your slides and we see your notes. We're, we're working on that. We're working on that right now. So oh. If I reclaim post will be that. Oh, let me play a video for you.
Let me translate what just my sister Marzi said. Hi, my name is Marzi. It's my pleasure to speak to you about my sister's thesis proposed project for you. Dancing in Silence is a thesis project that explores the idea of bridging the gap between hearing and deaf world. The thesis aims to design a space that facilitates the communication between people with different sensitivity. Like a language which is a tool for communication, architecture can serve as a platform for creating a space for people interactions. The proposed site is part of the development project next to the 6th Street. It involves a deaf culture center that relies on deaf space and uh, multisensory principles. Thanks and good luck, Maria. Uh, this is an um, uh, agenda for my uh, presentation, and I will define in this term as I go through. Um, a main source of inspiration for my thesis was my, sis was my sister Marzi. Uh, Marzi, a beautiful dancer, is profoundly hard of hearing. Growing up together, I learned that we have different approaches to navigate the world around us. Um, through the, uh, and for example, when we were children, I noticed that uh, she was very sensitive to both light and vibration to, uh, to, uh, and used this heightened awareness to gather information about her surrounding. The goals of the map, my project, what is, uh, what, uh, what is the project? It's a center for um, deaf art and deaf culture community, which welcomes hearing individual. Uh, what is the reason behind that? Bridging the gap between hearing and deaf world and normalizing the deaf culture and breaking the uh, cultural barrier and also introducing deaf gain to design to enrich a spatial experience. How I'm going to do that? Belair is teach the boundary of the Gallaudet campus along Sister Street to Union Market neighborhood, designing a in multisensory environment and incorporating deaf space principles. Uh, architecture is a platform for human interaction and nonverbal communication. Um, however, if we uh, don't pay attention, we tend to design places that privilege certain people over uh, others, adults over children, um, average size over large or small so, uh, people, uh, fully mo mobile versus those who require assistance. Uh, and hearing people over the deaf individual. In asking the question, how can we create um, an environment that supports the culture of deaf and hard of hearing people and also welcomes those who are not part of the community? Uh, uh, this consideration of uh, a deaf culture and deaf uh, space is a way to get to the larger question, how we, can we design environments that privilege and welcome and accommodate uh, a wider variety of people? What do we need to pay attention to? For, um, I'll give it, here is some uh, uh, concept that uh, I'm going to define. Deaf culture is a set of uh, unique principles uh, unique characteristics and values shared between uh, deaf individual and uh, that sign language is a mean tool to, to communicate and deaf gain is a concept in the culture that uh, highlight and uh, um, uh, uh, highlight the value of the um, aspect of a deaf being way of being um, for example, studies have shown that uh, deaf people have a stronger, have a better uh, peripheral vision. And deaf space is a guideline and principle designed by uh, architects at Gallaudet, Hansel Bauman, to accommodate uh, the a space for deaf individual. Deaf space is a strategy to support deaf culture. The first one is sensory reach. There shouldn't be any distraction in space for hearing uh, for deaf people uh, because people, uh, um, those people read the activities in their surrounding. It's best to not 
put any obstructure to obstruct the visual um, interaction and have a greater um, angle. Light and color. Uh, some colors uh, like blue and green that, uh, uh, um, that create contrast with body skin uh, for most people um, are peripheral in designing the uh, space uh, and uh, because it uh, accommodates the sign is conversing in sign language and also soft and diffused light that uh, is uh, toned down. It reduces ice strain. Uh, mobility and proximity uh, says that uh, uh, um, when people want to uh, sign and walk, there shouldn't be any um, obstacle and barrier uh, in front of them to uh, be able to move uh, easily. And uh, last one is the space and proximity. Uh, there, uh, there should be a, a good uh, uh, a space between people uh, when um, they walk through the space to be able to uh, have a conversation in sign language. Okay. Um, now, where is the best uh, place to explore this idea? I chose Gallaudet University, uh, founded in 1864. Uh, Washington DC's Gallaudet University uh, is the only university exclusive, exclusively dedicated for deaf individual uh, and, uh, and, hard, uh, and hard of hearing also. The university mission is to ensure the intellectual and professional advancement of a deaf and hard of hearing individual through American Sign Language and also written English. Here's a site in the larger context in Washington, D.C. As you see, it's located in the northeast of the um, city uh, and is not far from the downtown. Main road around the Gallaudet are Florida, um, New York, and uh, Maryland Avenue. Also, H Street. Uh, is located here that I'm going to talk uh, about this uh, hub. Okay, uh, here is the uh, uh, Gallaudet uh, in in uh, in his, uh, neighbors and shows the connection uh, relationship with his neighbor. Uh, the main gate uh, is located uh, in front of the Eighth Street and Florida Avenue and connect the Gallaudet to the H Street. Uh, that is a community hub, biggest community hub in Washington DC for deaf people. And the uh, Metro line also is located here, um, line, uh, red Metro line and um, Noma, St uh, Noma station is five uh, minutes uh, far, uh, walk far from the Gallaudet. Um, and uh, uh, and here is some pictures. For example, a Starbucks signing a store at H Street, which is a uh, very famous and commercial area uh, here, and some activities at a un a Union Market, which is located across the Sixth Street, and uh, view for uh, for residential part at Gallaudet. Fences around the Gallaudet uh, were added after Martin Luther King uh, uh, protest in 1968. Uh, since then, uh, the campus attitude toward, toward uh, its uh, neighbors has been to creating a strong boundary. Uh, good fences makes uh, good neighbor. Uh, although uh, the first Im um, impression was uh, noble, it uh, seems uh, like it has uh, it, it it has lost its purpose um, these days. Uh, keeping the fences around the Gallaudet um, is a con controversial topic. Some believe that it uh, ret it helps to retain the culture of the Gallaudet, uh, but uh, um, and uh, and uh, cent uh, central deaf community. 
uh, principle and value. I believe by removing uh, fences, Gallaudet can open its border to the larger community while is retaining its culture. Uh, in our daily life uh, and uh, family level, there is no physical boundary between uh, hearing uh, and deaf individual. But we should have that at the high educational level. Can we make this boundary less dividing? Here is a, um, a diagram that shows the idea. I, I had actually I had an idea of a stitching across the. Uh, 6th Street um, um, from uh, my personal experience with my sister and my family. Uh, this uh, boundary didn't feel uh, right for me. And uh, I started working on my thesis. I, I, uh, I was thinking that it would be one of the, my, my main goal. As I did my research, I, I was excited to see that Gallaudet also, uh, it, it, this idea is also important for Gallaudet. Here is the Gallaudet's plan development at the age of the 6th Street. Um, uh, as you see, there are, uh, um, there are several parcels in Gallaudet's properties also across the street for residential uh, mixed-use buildings, residential retail building, uh, university building, and uh, residential. It's just a proposal that is uh, changing uh, and is not the newest, it's some information that is op open to public. Center for Deaf Arts and Culture. This is a focus site of my project. Uh, currently is a parking garage um, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, there's a sections that cut through the um, uh, site and goes to the um, Olmsted Garden and uh, connect the 6th Street to the uh, historical uh, buildings around the uh, garden. You can see one of the most beautiful uh, buildings in the um, campus here in this picture and uh, some other historical building. These are the concept and program of my project. Uh, you can see that uh, my project uh, explores the idea of bringing deaf and hard of hearing together. Um, so uh, for that reason, uh, I, I added uh, three new streets to stitch the uh, city to the uh, campus. Mm. And also for the program, um, the uh, uh, the main idea was uh, for creating a deaf uh, art uh, and culture space uh, that provide a platform for uh, com meeting, communicating, and engaging uh, um, through the uh, different uh, spaces uh, to facilitate the interactions, collaboration, and increasing the curiosity. Uh, for people, and also adding some multi-sensory uh, environments uh, to enrich people's experience. Here is the site plan. As you see, that uh, the um, building um, uh, is uh, part of the development, and it's a, it's a actually is a meeting gate for the Gallaudet next to the new street coming from the new residential buildings and goes to the heart of the building. Uh, this new proposal is trying to stitch and blending the boundary of the campus. Here is this uh, uh, view of the 6th street. As you see, a new a resident block, um, a residential block uh, added at the top that is uh, connected with a bridge to the next uh, residential block. Main uh, um, entrance to the center is from the 60th Street, and the residential uh, entrance is from the pedestrian pathway uh, here.
walk through the building. Uh, here is the main entrance. Uh, as you see, there are uh, two uh, glass elevator, uh, for, uh, four uh, glass ball that facilitate rich sensory strategy. Um, also, the uh, wide hallways um, lead you to the core of the building and addresses the mobility requirements. There's a cafe and uh, there's a cafe and um, art and uh, craft, deaf art and craft shop uh, at the building. And uh, you can uh, look at the lower ground to the gravel garden that I'll uh, talk later about it. Uh, and uh, again, maximizing the visual con con uh, connection between the le uh, different levels at the building. Landing in the lower uh, level, uh, uh, he, here is a gravel garden. Uh, as you see, uh, it's designed to st stimulate haptic sense. Uh, there is a wooden walkway that provides a connection among these uh, three garden, uh, gravel garden, water garden, and fragment garden. There is a pathway. Uh, to accommodate the mobility in the building. So we arrive to the main core of the building at the, at the lower level. And you see the walkways that I talk about to connect the uh, different garden in the building. The courtyard is a, uh, uh, provides a natural life with uh, skylight and glazing. Um, as you can see, the walls are painted in blue to comply with the color strategy in the space design. Also, spaces have visual uh, access which accommodate rich sensory. You can look to the performance hall wall. You can see the rehearsal uh, wall and also the campus. Here is a, a section uh, from the building. Uh, uh, it's showing that um, there is a uh, fragrant garden. And uh, as you see, uh, we are going up to the plaza. Uh, and, uh, uh, that, and it's kind of a garden is, is kind of the blending to the larger garden in a campus and belaying the boundary. Oh, uh, and uh, this is a view uh, from the performance hall to the go fragrant garden and view to the, um, to the water garden. Here is uh, upper floor uh, uh, plans, uh, second floor, uh, which accommodate uh, the vo uh, educational part for collaboration, workshop, game room. And the third floor uh, is uh, for uh, ad administrative and uh, uh, access to the roof garden here. And the fourth is a typical floor plan for residential part. Here uh, is access to the campus uh, from, the uh, from the first floor. As you see, there's a hallway that you can land to the um, plaza. And also from the um, lower level performance hall and green, uh, and you can see the uh, green roof at top of the um, second, at the same level at the uh, third floor. Uh, to conclude, uh, the, um, what I talked, uh, this site, se site section shows that uh, how the building uh, is uh, um, addressing the uh, transition from the 6th Street, a new high, um, purple, um, um, high building uh, as part of the proposal for Gallaudet, uh, to the uh, heart of the campus and residential uh, building uh, and uh, trying to create uh, diff um, um, balconies in the, uh, spaces to maximize the visual con uh, connection. Uh, this axon shows the plaza uh, 
uh, in an orange uh, color. Uh, as you see, uh, the plaza goes around the um, goes to the uh, other uh, development to kind of uh, blending the uh, whole um, 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 areas i mean uh, it's it's like it, it is kind of uh, part of the whole threshold to the campus and itself is also a threshold uh, uh, to the uh, to the campus uh, and creates a harmony with the whole uh, design. Um, I summarize uh, my talk. My talk. Uh, I discuss about uh, building designs without privilege certain people over other, and introduce deaf culture and deaf space principle. And uh, I talked about the Galut attitude about its border, and also introduce a deaf a center for deaf art and culture. Um, that can be used with uh, hearing people also. I close uh, my presentation with a quote from Rumi and thank you for attention and uh, I will be happy to take any question you may have. Thank you uh, very much. And I just want to remind folks at home, what we're going to do is we're going to stop the presentation here. If you want to follow along any of the questions, we're going to try to answer based on the drawings on the wall um, and the facsimile of the drawings on the wall for those of you at home is the PDF that was found on that spreadsheet that I shared with everybody. So if there are any questions from online or from here in person. Uh, we'll try to get those going at the moment. Break the ice and go right ahead, Irena. And All right. Well, thank you so much for your thoughtful presentation. And I do appreciate the effort that went into developing uh, your uh, master thesis presentation and the content. I happen to have the privilege to actually be tied to Gallaudet University and was working with the architect Hansel Bauman when he moved from San Francisco, when I was part of the very early master planning efforts for the entire Noma area, when we're trying to bring Sing Street across and actually as a crescent through the development, thus tying the actual parcels that belong to Gallaudet University and really stitch the campus together because it is truly important for how uh, that community operates and how safety is accomplished. So can you explain to me the actual stitching across Sixth Street that you described as your project being tied to and that organizing principle. And uh, I'm really interested in that outdoor space that you created facing Sixth Street and why do you believe that it will be successful in terms of light, in terms of providing connectivity to the adjacent mixed-use commercial development, which is fairly dense at this point. When, uh, let me repeat your question to make sure that I understood your question. Uh, these outdoor spaces in Gallaudet, how uh, address the is teaching the boundary of the Gallaudet? Uh, Correct, I mean, the teaching uh, the connection with uh, across Sixth Street, as you were describing as part of your uh, efforts in this project. So, let me pull up my presentation to uh, go over my section in a minute. Yeah, uh, they can see my mouse, yeah? Uh, yeah, maybe, I can see it very well, thank you. Maybe I need to make it bigger. Uh, 
So I'm trying to make the section bigger. I can. Uh, I can. I'm not sure if why the resolution is not. Uh, I have it in everything. front of me on a separate screen as a PDF. So oh. I'll please describe yeah, but, to me yeah. why do you but, believe that this will be successful? It's also valuable, Mariam, that you did that for people who are watching online. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thank thank you for showing it. Oh, my pleasure. Um, um, I'm. Uh, I think with the um, connecting the gardens. And the, uh, actually, the main idea was connecting the uh, Union Markets area to the heart of the campus. Uh, and these gardens that are uh, sloping up to the uh, heart of the Gallaudet was uh, kind of uh, creates the same atmosphere at the edge of the Gallaudet. I mean, uh, it's uh, this place is a uh, it is a place open to public. Uh, uh, right now, you, uh, there, there isn't a way to get to the Gallaudet. I was thinking to put a place if we have a place in the age uh, age of the Gallaudet that people have access to that and uh, in for uh, for uh, they, they can go in uh, any time that they want and uh, and uh, creating uh, some area. Uh, mostly gardens that create multi-sensory environment, uh, uh, connect the, um, connect the um, campus to the, it's a transition, it's a threshold with the busy uh, Sixth Street and very quiet and uh, tranquil uh, Olmsted garden. Um, I mean, the main idea is bringing people the uh, the kind uh, blurring boundary is kind of the uh, creating a experience. Uh, as I'm trying to show in my renders, uh, uh, I'm trying to uh, design the experience for people to welcome them. And uh, right now, the uh, I mean um, a place that uh, also uh, hear also hearing people are uh, willing to. Uh, go there and uh, communicate uh, uh, in uh, i mean uh, find a way to communicate with people that have a different language and culture uh, that concept sh creating shared a space is part of the stitching and uh, stitching the boundary uh, at uh, age of the 6th street um Maria? Could you um, expand on that in terms of talking about how your building is different and similar to the other buildings that are planned along 6th Street um, to create that new edge and um, perhaps through talking about your program and through the choices you made, how is it similar and different and builds on the efforts along of the other buildings? Yes, Professor, sure. Uh, yeah, the, the building is, uh, uh, in terms of the um, being a, a university building and uh, uh, residential is the same as other uh, buildings, but uh, in terms of the uh, creating uh, you, uh, spaces that, uh, that uh, creates unique experience, in terms of that part is uh, kind of a unique, uh, uh, I think, and um, maybe maybe I can jump in. My understanding is that in that whole edge of campus, Gallaudet had planned a series of buildings where there's commercial on the ground and residential above. And your choice in program changes that commercial into program for Gallaudet, right? And that's performing art spaces. And that's things that also might bring in other people, as well as your choice to have a cafe on the Sixth Street and an arts and a culture um, uh, effort on Sixth Street. So, in many ways, you've adopted some of the like volume and choices of the other buildings, but you've made some changes. So maybe you could yeah. Um, yeah. talk to that. Yeah, yeah, yes, Professor. Sure. Yeah, uh, the front. Yeah, the uh, the frontage of the 6th Street Cafe and uh, 
art and craft shop is meant to uh, address the retail uh, part of the um, uh, consistent with the retail uh, um, uh, program at the edge of the 6th street and uh, it, uh, threshold uh, here uh, for service area and uh, and then come to the new world i mean the very different kind of the experience in this area courtyard gardens perf uh, exhibition performance um, is uh, kind of a, my main important programs are located here uh, that is between uh, that is between that uh, retail part and uh, uh, deaf community. Thank you. I, I believe your idea of outdoor rooms and gardens and that sequence of spaces is a very um, very yes. successful conceptual approach to what uh, is needed in this place. Thank yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, as in this courtyard uh, that is surrounded by garden, uh, as you see in these perspectives, uh, I, uh, and a, a color a skylight that creating a, a kinetic painting uh, uh, through the different hours of the day uh, with natural uh, light. Uh, this is this. This was part of the um, significant experience, and also creating a maximized visual interaction between. Uh, uh, maybe in the plan, I can. Uh, it was. It's more clear. Uh, no, I mean in the section. Uh, yeah, the maximize the visual connection between all. Um, these uh, spaces uh, that uh, can have a look to this um, special experience at the core of the building. Um, Mariam, thank you so much for your presentation. It's such an interesting premise and interesting um, thesis. Uh, I, I really appreciated how you explained your project as a meeting gate between the Garden University and the community beyond the sixth street. Um, and I'm imagining, you know, this, you've designed this place so that it has these sort of like spaces for different types of users to use it, right? Like people who are deaf and people with hearing, people from the university and also the public who are arriving at this space. Um, so I was wondering how does, you know, beyond the program and the sort of exterior spaces that you've created, how does the concept of your spatial language sort of address these different types of users? In other words, if I was just walking through the street and, and arrived at this place and I'm walking around, you know, different spaces in your building, how would I understand that this center is for the deaf and also for the hearing? Um, could you talk about some of the spatial qualities that you designed here? Um, sure. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, actually, um, uh, let me repeat your question. Uh, what are the uh, um, spatial quality of the space that is shared between hearing and uh, and uh, how uh, I address the communication? How uh, how I, I the the, uh, the um, philosophy that explained at the first of the presentation? How they uh, they create a communication between different community? Is that a question? Yeah, sure. Because I'm imagining there's going to be users with different types of you know multi sensory. Mm -hmm. capabilities and abilities and different ways to experience this building. Um, what, what differentiates this building as something designed for the deaf and also for the hearing, you know, different types of user groups? Uh, sure. Um, in, the multi -sense, in designing a multisensory environment, the initial idea was uh, that uh, um, we, uh, we um, all uh, experience, for example, the sunlight, uh, uh, we, we can uh, uh, experience the same, uh, I mean, uh, we have the same uh, feeling when we uh, um, sense, uh, we sense something in, uh, uh, we experience place with multi-sensory and, for example, uh, 
um, experiencing sunlight in a building, uh, th that was a um, uh, idea in my thought that it's uh, it's a it's a it creates a, co a connection between people. Uh, same experience in the building for people uh, and also uh, it uh, it can be a platform uh, to encourage uh, uh, in, uh, collaboration between people and uh, also also it brings the hearing community uh, to uh, see the, to experience the deaf culture and uh, know about the uh, unique aspect of the deaf, deaf culture i mean for example uh, a performance uh, uh, event by deaf individual can uh, increase the awareness in hearing community uh, and uh, and also um, with uh, um, uh, and also they can feel that uh, um, they can and they they can uh, uh, see that uh, if uh, someone is uh, missing s s one of uh, their senses, uh, the other senses can heighten and, and uh, create. M maybe he hearing people that can uh, experience a, hi a heighten heightening their experience of a space if they uh, uh, have a say, if they understand that. Uh, we can, uh, I mean, uh, have it uh, a richer experience of the space, uh, like the uh, deaf individual who are more sensitive in some um, um, aspect uh, compared with us. Uh, this is John Fontellas. I, uh, I appreciate uh, all the work that you've put into the your thesis here. I was actually very intrigued by the title um, "Dancing in Silence," and then hearing that your sister, uh, you know, um, practices movement and dance. I thought uh, was very interesting. What I like about the project, uh, you seem to have been able to make a very complex sectional relationship between the spaces. With very few moves, I mean the uh, the courtyard space, the the tilt down for the the gardens, as well as the the exterior uh, amphitheater. I think those are just very simple moves that provide a level of three dimensionality that uh, could be amazing to see uh, your sister dancing in and around all those different spaces. Uh, it would be, be uh, I think it's a, a wonderful thing that you've uh, sort of created there. I guess one question I would have is. Um, uh, I, I know you've inserted this into an existing, I guess, plan for commercial building. Uh, any thought to maybe expanding it to the, the residential units up above? Uh, why uh, was that uh, any thought? Had you given any thought to incorporating uh, the units up above? I, I would really, uh, I think would be very interesting to see how a residential unit could also reflect uh, the ideas that you've incorporated in for the cultural center down below. Uh, yes, uh, I, 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 I'm, I totally um, agree. Yeah, uh, I mean, the next step would be for me to explore the idea, to extend the uh, idea to the residential part. Uh, I chose to uh, focus on the uh, deaf culture center. Uh, I, I thought that uh, it it's, creates a more area for me to work on the um, pro, for the program. But yes, definitely uh, that would be uh, that would be the next move to incorporate to the design of uh, to go to uh, have a thought to design the residential uh, building. I think um, I went to school at Berkeley. And at uh, Berkeley, there was a school called the California School for the uh, for the Deaf. That at the time I was there, uh, right before I was there, they actually picked it up. It was adjacent to the university. They picked it up and moved it to a suburban location. And a lot of the controversy at that time was um, when the school was in the heart of the city. There was, uh, you know, the the idea that uh, uh, those who with a, a dis disability would be, you know, immersed in the city and 
and would be as much a part of the city as any, any other uh, person. The problem when you move into a suburban location is obviously you're, you're sort of in this gated surround. That's why I was very uh, you know, excited about you talking about, uh, honestly, you know, the idea of recognizing the boundary, um, but trying to find a way to connect through. And, and maybe an idea would be to see if you could stitch it across to the other side as well, um, that maybe the, the center could be on both sides. Because in a way, you know, uh, uh, and it goes also to the program, in a way you've brought the commercial things across to your side, what would it be if you were to uh, implant or intersperse other program elements on the, the civic side, uh, going forth to your idea of, of stitching across. I, I think there's something there that you might wanna expand upon because I, I love the idea of, you know, that that's what universal design is. It's not accommodating um, uh, differences. It's recognizing those differences and finding ways to uh, come together. Uh yes uh, i totally agree uh, that that's 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 a part that can ex uh, extend into the union market and connecting a uh, gallaudet mall uh, from the um, I mean, there, there is a sequence between the union market. When uh, I walked through the union market to the heart of the Gallaudet, I felt mm -hmm. that, that sequence uh, from the uh, civic uh, area to the triangular, uh, you know, a space, a unique space uh, to the Gallaudet. That, that's, that's uh, yeah, that's that would be definitely uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 great to exp to explore that idea more in detail on that part totally agree yeah folks i'm gonna step in here and ask uh ronit eisenbach who was the chair of this committee to make some summary remarks um sorry that we had some glitches getting started miriam thank you ronit would you uh care to make some sure comments? sure i would love to um, so first of all, actually, let me change my screen so I can see everybody and I'll be quick because I'm going to run out of juice and don't want to go get my, um, get my, uh, cord and interrupt this. So, um, first of all, I really appreciate the comments from the jury. I think they were right on in terms of where the opportunities are to expand this idea. Um, it got cut from Mariam's presentation, but there's actually a number of deaf owned businesses in the neighborhood uh, across H Street. And we're you know, starting to imagine that would happen across 6th Street as well. And so John, I think your point about like, what if it was on that other side? Um, and the point also about you know, the residential. Um, we chose, you know, I advised Mariam to focus on the public spaces below. And we, and the, we agreed that we should bring the building to the heights of the other building with the same development principles so that there could ever be a chance that this first floor could be developed in this way. Um, and Irina is exciting to hear that you helped work on this. Um, Yun Chi and uh, Sun Kim, I really appreciate your comments. I think the question about, you know, what makes this space different? Uh, in a certain way, for those of us who here, probably wouldn't notice the difference. We would just think maybe it's more light filled and beautiful gardens and spacious in these colors. If we weren't familiar with deaf space principles of design, we wouldn't necessarily recognize that this, it's wider or these colors because um, as deaf space principles, because in some ways, hopefully it just is good design and it accommodates the communities. You know, I was very conscious that Mariam's sister wore a black shirt when she was signing. And I was thinking with people with darker skin, maybe they wear lighter shirts for the contrast. So I think that if it was actually successful, we would see people who are both signing and people who weren't enjoying the space and people who are signed didn't have to accommodate to narrower corridors or watch where they walk or things like that. And um, I wanted to just, um, Save one or two thoughts. I think that first, you know, the project is inspiring, Mariam. It inspires all of us to think about not just, you know, the you focused on the deaf community, um, the hard of hearing community, but I think this project is important in our larger efforts to think about how we create spaces that are inclusive for all. 
and not be blind, not have blinders on by what we know and what has happened before. And John, your point about universal design is not about accommodating difference, but actually understanding it, recognizing it, celebrating it, including it, you know, I still need to carry a foot cushion when I sit in most chairs, for example, right? That's a minor thing. And so I think given our, especially our political climate, um, and I think our goals of architecture being inclusive, your project helped us become aware of a particular condition, but it's applicable to the larger um, context. And so I'd like to just leave with two quotes from your presentation. One, that architecture is a, a platform for human interaction and nonverbal communication. How do we create a, an environment that welcomes a larger group of people? What do we need to pay attention to? And I think that, that's a really important question. I will think about that as an educator and as a designer. And then the last quote from Rumi, which I think is a good way to end something like this. Before I start with saying congratulations, Marianne, because I want to end with Rumi. But I closed my mouth and spoke to you in a, in a thousand silent ways. I think that's a beautiful quote, something we all should take in. But that's also what architecture is, right? We are taught, we are communicating when it's done well, non-verbally and um, and crossing cultures, crossing, you know, light is something, yes, we can all enjoy, um, but we don't necessarily pay attention to it. So again, I closed my mouth and spoke to you in a thousand silent ways, Rumi. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you. And as is traditional, we usually conclude theses with an applause. But in this context, I recommend that we do it the way that folks at Gallery Deck would sing their pieces. So. <laughs> Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your thoughtful. Thank you for the Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, jurors, for your comments. Thank you, Alec, for being our expert witness on the jury. Let's give us a couple seconds here to get ourselves back to square one. And Thank you so much for joining us today. So I just want to thank you. Thank you for inviting us. It's always uh, incredible. You know, John, John, I, I never understood why you cringed when I said I was going to leave all your books to you and your, my books to you and your wife, but now I understand your backdrop. And, and just, yeah. Front or back buttons. Okay. You need to speak into this though too at the same time. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce Jocelyn Belmonte. Her committee chair was Professor Juan Burke, and joined by Professor Joseph Williams and myself as the committee. And we're going to move from Gallaudet University to Mexico. Thank you. Hello, everyone. As Brian mentioned, uh, my name is Jocelyn Belmonte, and thank you for coming to see our presentations today. 
This project is called Enmendar el Zócalo, or translated to Amending the Plan. Today in Mexico, education is, the educational system lacks um, resources. Buildings are not in great settings. There is a lack of sunlight and technology. We also have to consider the home setting of these students. Um, most of these students don't have internet, so they have to go to a neighbor's house to borrow Wi-Fi, and hopefully it's not slowed down by the other users as well. Um, also considering transportation, um, these students have to walk to their schools as most of the, most of the people in Mexico do not have um, cars. So what I would love to see is a school that is uplifting for the community and that connects to the community's lifestyle. Yanga is, is a small town located in central Veracruz, Mexico, um, 50 miles away from Veracruz's capital, Jalapa. A bit of the history, um, this town was founded by an African slave who ran away from the Spanish Empire in the 16th century. Um, this town was founded with the idea of freedom by Gaspar Yanga, who we can see in the, in the picture on the left. Um, he was a leader of the slave rebellion and today is acknowledged as um, a hero in this town. Though living through hardship, um, the Socalo called Parque de Yanga that we can see in the top right um, is a main square that keeps this town lively for the people to enjoy in this warm tropical climate. Yanga is made of 10 neighborhoods um, that we can consider divided into three communities. Um, the architecture in this town uses simple materials to create housing that adapts to this setting. Um, the, of these three gridded communities, um, we will focus on the two northern ones, General Francisco Paz and General Aratriste. General Francisco Paz and General Alatriste are similar in their infrastructure. Um, both of these towns have a main square in the center, which is an open field of grass. Um, these, these central squares have no seating, no shading, so it has little to no use. Um, at the perimeter of the square, we do have an elementary school, a church, and shops that have fast foods. The lower portion of Yanga, um, is is important to the upper two um, communities as this is an area with um, that is as a source for food. Um, so the connection points between the three communities is one bridge um, between them. So multiple um, problems are to be focused on in Yanga, but the focus is for this thesis is creating a public square or public spaces for the users, um, accessibility to food, and education that we'll go into further. As far as the land use, the surrounding land is mainly dedicated to agriculture. Um, these fields are owned by the residences of these, of these communities. The elderly and the young families of these communities come together to maintain these lands. At a young age, the children um, learn to plant, grow, care and pick for these um, fields. And these lands are then passed down to the children. In this town, we see a various amount of vibrant um, ornamental plants that we can incorporate into this project. And we can also see um, corn, sugarcane, beans, and other fruits and veggies, vegetables, being grown in this land. Uh, this project, again, will focus on the three issues of education, public spaces, and food. So we will be creating a school for this project. So here I introduce you the Agricultural School of Yanga. This will be a middle school and high school that will serve for 700 students. Um, this school will assist in the general education of the students while focusing on agriculture and livestock. This school will teach the students to grow, maintain, and prepare these crops. And at the end of their education, these students will receive a certificate of completion in, advan in hopes of an advantage to find jobs in the similar fields for these students. 
This will hopefully motivate the residents to want to stay in this town, be educated, and have hope for their futures and families. We will also create the large public square um, that we will reflect as the Socalo or the Parque de Yanga that we previously saw. For the location of this site um, in the Burgundy shaded area, um, we have a 27 acre plot between these three communities. Um, this allows us to build a campus that has a field dedicated to the vegetation and the livestock without obstructing the surrounding context. As we can see in the diagram, um, the green dots represent the elementary schools, which we see several of, and middle and high school, we only have one. This may be the reason why the average dropout grade in this, um, in this town is sixth grade. For these students, for the students of General Francisco Paz and General Alatriste, the students have to walk 40 minutes to arrive to their middle or high school. So choosing this location now allows the students of these two communities to arrive to the school in roughly seven minutes. Okay, now we'll go into the program of the campus. Um, this program is broken down into two phases. Um, phase one has the classrooms, the library, auditorium, the cafeteria, and the agricultural field. Uh, once we get into phase two, we'll have the extension of the classrooms and the livestock and dormitories for the students and staff. In coming up with the architecture, the architectural language, um, I wanted something that was simple through its palettes and that was able to be modified um, to be monumental based on the the use of the of the buildings. Um, also something functional um, and again monumental. So here are your a few precedents that influenced um, this project. First, we have the social production of housing by Comunal. Um, Comunal works with several social housings and indigenous community. Um, this project uses a simple palette of concrete, brick, and bamboo allowing the structure to breathe and allow natural sunlight into the structure. This structure was also um, built by the community, um, integrating with the simple structure. Next, we have the primary school in Gando by Frank, by Francis Quere. Um, this primary school also uses a simple palette and becomes monumental through the elevated roof um, to the elevated roof. Um, also, there are openings within the roof that allow for a passive cooling system um, throughout the day. And then uh, I liked how they use um, a simple technology to allow for the openings of the windows for users. Next, we have Court by Rosana Montiel. This, this is a combined space of a library, a gym, a sports area, and an assembly space. Rosana uses concrete as a solid and porous material, allowing sunlight and air in collaboration spaces and closing off spaces that are private, such as restrooms. Last, we have the heart of the town, um, Parque de Yanga. This Socalo um, is a central square, which in the Mexican culture is significant. Um, in this space, users come together, meet and enjoy a live atmosphere um, with vendors selling toys or foods and occasional performances. This park is also well vegetated, has several seating, so it has really become an influence for the school's plaza. So here is the overall site plan of the project, um, and I'll go into the two phases. Okay, phase one, we have a complete campus that has the administration, the cafeteria, classrooms, gym, and the plaza. Um, sorry, here you go. And with this plaza, we wanted to replicate the socalo or the typical squares that we see in Mexico. So with the open plaza, you typically have the cathedral, a town hall, shops at the perimeter um, with the open plaza in the center. 
um, to take influence for the organization of this school, we have the auditorium acting as the cathedral, administration acting as a town hall, and the shops which can be compared to the cafeteria. Then we have the plaza which will, be, um, will bring a live atmosphere with the users. Entering the plaza, you'll find um, a plaza full of vegetation that we previously seen in the vegetation slide um, and a clear path to the heart of the campus. This plaza is full of ornamental, vibrant vegetation and leads directly to the auditorium building in case there is a public event, the users know exactly where to go. Here are views of the entry of the public plaza and the private plaza. Um, this lower portion is for the public, then once you get into the campus, you'll go into the school's plaza. Um, in the first plaza, we have, we have seating, several seating options such as benches, tables, and we have pergolas for vendors to post up where they can sell foods, toys, or any goods. Um, this gives an opportunity for the families as they drop off their, their child, they can shop for today's dinner, enjoy the, enjoy the weather, and simply just have a nice outdoor area they can go to. Once into the campus, um, the students have this area that's fully vegetated, um, that has seating options where the students can work on homework, meet other students, and collaborate with each other. For the materials of this building, such as um, the social housing precedent, um, I wanted to use a simple palette and include the community to be able to be part of the construction. Um, the palette of this facade can be transformed to be either simple or monumental based on the use. Um, each of the buildings have bamboo columns and the elevated roofs with openings in the ceilings for the passive cooling system. Once looking at the monumental building of the library, we can see that we use um, lattices, sorry, we use lattices and solid um, brick barriers for the, for the architectural components of the elevations. And for the library to make it monumental, we have it lifted up on a few steps and we use um, the influence of the nature of bamboo of a bamboo forest to replicate and highlight the entrances to these buildings. Once we get to the agricultural plan, we'll harvest corn, sugarcane, turmeric, and other fruits and vegetables. Um, this allows the students to grow, care, pick, and take to the nearby cafeteria, which would be this building, where the students have the opportunity to be in a culinary classroom where they can learn to prepare these foods. Here we have phase two, the addition is in purple. Um, at the northern area, we have um, the dormitories and then we have one more classroom building as the school expands. This is where we also bring in the livestock into the campus. Um, bringing in the dormitories into the campus allows the students and the faculty to, to stay on campus and avoid a long distance travel in case no car um, is owned. Okay, so here we have a look of where the dormitories are and the new classroom. So the portion of the livestock on the campus has chickens, cows, and pigs. Um, some of these animals are seen at the residences of these of this town um, as a source of food. So the students would learn how to raise and care and attend to these animals in case in the future maybe they want to go into such as a veterinary position or so. They have some type of experience from there also. In conclusion, the educational, environmental, and social setting in this town is important as currently it's not being given to this town. So I would like to propose the Agricultural School of Yanga in, to assist with the creation of the education and the social setting of this town. Um, so thank you everyone for listening to my presentation and I'll open up for questions and comments.
करते हैं फिर Thank you so much, uh, Jocelyn, for your excellent presentation. I think it's so interesting how you're using local agricultural resources to provide education. Uh, um, and you're also using the bank and you're using uh, material consideration for your um, buildings. I was wondering, you know, you've designed a lot of courtyard spaces and obviously with use of agriculture, you're designing a lot of spaces in between buildings. Could you talk about a little more about how you've considered those spaces for educational access and for agricultural growth? Like how did, how did you decide to sort of design those spaces in between buildings for those purposes? Yes, so let me see if I can zoom in. I can't zoom in. I don't know how to use the mouse. Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, There's just a little bit of a delay on everything. What, what do you want to look at? Okay, yeah, the second one. Yeah, so part of the site plan um, was trying to consider um, how much of the portion would be dedicated to the agricultural fields. Then we also wanted to consider um, if the school is to be expanded, should we leave space open for the campus? So where the dormitory areas are, um, you know, we can bring in the, the living portion, but on the right side of the dormitories, we have um, areas for extension as needed. Um, also integrating small um, gardens within the campus, so we allow this to become a um, to become a walking such as a, like a outdoor classroom where the teachers can bring the students out throughout the campus to bring in that outdoor environment and as a learning experience so from the different ornamentation that takes place in the different part in the different gardens and then the agricultural fields sorry does that answer your question yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I think it's very interesting how you've designed spaces that overlap interior and exterior um, for different educational purposes and how you've thought about these spaces at, in different stages of growth, at different right. phases of expansion. So yeah, thank you for such a compelling presentation. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Yes, we have a question here. Thank you so much. This is a fascinating presentation, um, a really ele elegant design. And um, uh, right now I'm chairing another thesis for next semester of Jennifer Pineda, similar kind of concept in that there's, she's looking at impoverished regions of Guatemala and how education is breaking down in those regions. Just like you said, after sixth grade, everyone leaves to go uh, do agricultural work and your idea of integrating agriculture into the curriculum of education is a brilliant move. I think you've also introduced a great deal of placeness to this impoverished community. Uh, sometimes kind of the placeness breaks down in these communities because they're strung out having to work jobs in a bigger city uh, walking 45 minutes outside the town to get to school and there's no center in the town anymore if there, or if there is a center it's old and and not well cared for I feel like you've made a campus that's a an urban center and I you spoke about monumentality as a way of doing that can you speak more to your strategy for monumentality whether it be uh, facades long spans, axes. I'd be interested to hear about that. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so for the program um, currently, sorry, for the campus currently, um, 
this would be the one bridge that connects to the to this uh to these communities so i don't know what i wanted to bring into the project is giving a secondary um, access in case something happens to the bridge then these people will have to go a long drive or walk just to enter the to the center so what i did was bring in another bridge that connects over from the i think i have a diamond sorry, that connects from the center of the town. And once they drive onto the bridge, they'll be able to see the, the monumental library and the plaza that's opened up. So what I wanted to um, highlight was the plaza. So once the user goes into this area, they'll be able to see that this is a public area and they can use um, this space. Then once there's any public, um, events they'll be able to go and venture into the campus um, also another um, something else that was added was lifting up the auditorium building um, that we can see in the center of the elevations over there and using the bamboo that would be used for the columns but also adding more to create that forest look which would attract the people as this is their first view going into the campus so hopefully this directs the users to this area which also can hopefully be used um, for the public with the library and the auditorium. Um, so I have a I have a quick question and a quick comment. Um, first of all, this is really really interesting, and um, the person who knows nothing about this region still can picture and imagine what it's like to be in that space. Um, that being said, I, I was hoping that there is a little bit of a introduction of the region, not just for its cultural and uh, the social heritage, but also what is the environment feels like, looks like, what is their range of the temperatures, what is their, you know, like a climate, where the water comes from and things like that. Um, and especially for the agriculture, I'm imagining the importance of the water, how the water cycle is actually impacting the site. Um, so I was hoping that a little bit of that introduction is part of your, um, the setting up of the thesis would be really, really helpful. But I really like the way that you kind of introduces the, um, the binoculars of how they use certain aspects to cool the, the building, um, all those kind of the passive systems that is already embedded into the culture that you are bringing in. Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit about um, not just for the formal aspect that you are um, um, adapting, which by the way, I love that you are replacing cathedral with the library as kind of the main focus of the monumental organ organizing um, element. Um, but I just want to hear what are those, um, the passive things that is learned by living um, that is also incorporated into your new, um, new school? Yeah, so my understanding, you want to know um, how this school will assist the students, correct? Yes. So. As I mentioned earlier, the surrounding lands um, are already being used by the residences where they're growing these crops. Um, at a young age, the, the students are helping their and assisting their families to get, you know, tonight's dinner or to hopefully sell to um, to neighbors or people of other towns. Um, sorry. Sorry, can you repeat the question? I forgot what, you, what I was saying. <laughs> No, so I just want to I just want to hear that um, overall, uh, when you are putting these buildings together, other than just monumentality of the building, the scale and size and such, whether something of the sustainability, the passive um, approaches that um, the culture and history has built into this vernacular, whether there has been some thoughts that how this building will operate, how this building will function the comfort is achieved in that regard, whether there is any um, ideas of sustainability has been played a role in placing your buildings and designing the spaces. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so going back to the um, organization of the Socalos, uh, as previously mentioned, and as you mentioned, um, having the auditorium as the um, cathedral, sorry, where's that diagram? And having the administration as the town hall gives that sense of the future that the students will be living as they'll come across several of these Socalos main squares um, within different towns. Um, sorry, I think, I think that's all I have for that question. Hi, Maddie. Yes. Thank you. Uh, you've created such a beautifully urban uh, Tsokolo, and it, it occurs to me to wonder whether the towns will then begin to fill in around it to create new development and uh, that it might become an actual center for, uh, uh, you know, a kind of um, uh, a town that's uniting the uh, others. Yes, yeah, so one of the concerns um, within the beginning of the project was choosing the placement. So, so previously I had um, the campus in this portion of the, of the site, but it was just too large to handle that then if people migrate, they'll begin to obstruct with the design of the plaza or of the school and um, I guess not leave the school as how it was to be. So when I moved it to this, to this um, 27 acre plot, then we were able to fence the campus, which is typically seen in schools in Mexico that avoids that situation where these people won't be able to, um, won't be able to build right next to the campus, but will then in the future, hopefully be able to um, build in the neighboring um, plotted areas if they're not used for agriculture. So hopefully, you know, more people do come to this area and to the school. <laughs> Hello, Peter. Hi, Irina, you had a question? Yes, I did have a question. I was not sure if anyone Sorry. else from the audience might have a question at this time. Uh, I really want to commend you on the depth of analysis and the thoughtfulness of bringing precedent, the uh, way of life into a very cohesive urban solution and uh, an element that will actually bring the urban fabric together and create the sense of community. And with that, I would like you to uh, talk a little bit uh, about your choice of phasing for this project. You selected that the educational uh, and learning part comes in first and the residential part comes second. However, there are viable other ways where you can create the blend given all the constraints that the community is facing. And why did you choose to make that right. separation of phasing? Yes, yeah, so in the beginning to um, work on this project, um, what we needed to give these students the education that they, um, that they need is a full campus. So with beginning with phase one was bringing in the administration, the cafeteria, library, auditorium, and the sports areas. Um, and then later on, as the school expands, bringing in the dormitories. So the original focus was um, agriculture, and that's how the phase one kind of became to be. Um, once we integrated phase two, we added the, the livestock, and greenhouses and the dormitories. Um, so first, I just mainly wanted a simple main campus and then um, thinking of the future of the expansion of what could possibly happen in the campus. And I mean, you know, this is one of the options, but um, seeing how the school works, another option can possibly be um, expanding the agricultural fields, you know? So this is an idea of what can begin to be seen in the campus. 
Thank you. I will highly recommend that you keep an open mind of um, providing the components that will guarantee success at the start. Mm -hmm. So you might consider a small residential component to be also part of all the other pieces. So you have a fully functional environment that you keep mm -hmm. adding on. Uh, I think the last, uh, even for uh, environments in the world where um, there are no pressures like the ones that you described in this particular region, we realized how uh, the blended environments serve us better uh, if yeah. we're isolated. And I will recommend that you keep an open mind in yeah. thinking of blending learning and living and providing for the living component to be part of maybe phase one of your project. But uh, excellent work and very thoughtful uh, way of incorporating local contextual uh, models and traditions into what will give a viability of a center for learning and community development. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your comment. I do agree, maybe bringing um, the dormitories in the first phase does make sense, as you know, mentioned that these users don't have cars. So as of now, would only these three communities, you know, be able to attend the school? But that doesn't include the, you know, surrounding towns in the areas and further. Thank you. Hi, Peter. This is a beautiful project, Jocelyn. I, um, I have a couple of comments. I was, when you're presenting the um, site in the cities, the towns, I was, you were talking about those green, open green squares that we just see a corner of, and I was thinking, oh, is that where the project is? And then when you when you you got to the actual site, I think that should be applauded. I think the site selection was very skillfully done, and then um, and it you know there's definitely the clear connection to the part of the town to the south and to the west. I, w I wonder about if you could um, also consider the connection to the east. Is are you, is that a gate or an opening to the west, or is it trying to be hermetically sealed? And the last comment I would say is I really love the site plan where you've broken down the scale, like you know, a, a North American high schools or in the 70s at least when I was there, there were these huge bulking places that didn't have windows. Here you've broken up the program. I, I just wonder if it could be broken up even more, you know, the scale of the three central um, buildings, you know, could there be a gap between the auditorium and the library? Could those be two volumes that read as one? But um, those are just kind of, you know, further considerations, but be beautiful project. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so in the beginning of the project, when I was um, first working on choosing the site and where to locate the school, um, I was kind of struggling with trying to decide should the campus go more to the east or to the west, but then that gives um, priority to one of the communities. So slowly the campus began to grow which I started with like 200 students and ended up with 700. And this allowed for the campus to grow significantly, also allowing um, significant sizes of fields and the dormitories. So once the campus grew to that size and considering the, um, the characteristics and the organizations of the Socalos, that's how the, the heart of the campus, such as the heart of the town, um, is being represented on the site. As far as the path that goes through the campus, um, where the dormitories are, um, that links into the into um, General Francisco Paz. But once you get to General Alatrice, that's where the the open field is dedicated to grazing for cows. So I didn't. Um, there is a gate there, but there isn't a path that cuts through the grazing for the cows. So that would be, I wonder how I can fix that, but to create that path and connect to that town. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have to... yeah, okay. Anyway, great project. Um, I echo what's been said. And I was thinking too about, um, that west end or the east end, I mean, and I, 
I, it, yeah, I forgot about the cows because I was just like, yeah, you could just extend that to that corner and you're done. So yeah, maybe there's a way to accommodate both of those kinds of uses. Um, I had a thought about, actually I did a little sketch. <laughs> um, you know how your auditorium and your library are side by side right now? So you have a really strong axial situation, axis, cross axis, and the cross axis resolves nicely in those two smaller buildings. Um, but at the auditorium, it feels like it's, you know, it kind of bumps into this, the edge of the auditorium. So I was wondering if, what if you put like the auditoriums in the middle and then you wrap it with the books, you know, so like the library is the, is the enclosure and you move through the books and then you create these little like side nooks for studying or something like that. But I also think that Peter's comment about maybe just breaking the whole thing down into smaller elements, but remembering those axes that you have set up and how those lead into the spaces. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Um, yeah, when it came to the auditorium and the library, I was kind of struggling of how to integrate both spaces together as, you know, I want both of these spaces to be able to be used by the public. So the, uh, it's a little blurry. Oh, sorry. So a way to um, to connect these two spaces, um, there would be a door that would be able to orbit there to kind of create that connection between the public and the public spaces when used um, for both areas. But I do like your suggestion of having the auditorium in the center and the library wrap around. Um, when it came to the auditorium, I, I was kind of like, how am I going to keep this place like nicely enclosed, wrapped up in case, you know, there's spotlights and all that, but still letting the building breathe. So I think allowing the um, library at the perimeter with the with the lattices would really help um, also. It's Brian. I wanted just to go back to uh, the question that, or the comment that Irena Savakova made uh, about the residential in the initial phase. And I wonder if one of the things we might think of is instead of trying to think of this thing as being zoned in plan and by use, rather zoning it in sections. So maybe the ground levels of these buildings could be the public spaces, the classroom spaces, and then the upper levels of these buildings could have functions like residential on them. And that would start to, in a way, mimic much more clearly the kind of organization that you find in a, in a traditional town. In a way, this is adopting a kind of, you know, pl zoning and plan that is, you know, kind of antithetical to that traditional town planning that one finds in places like Mexico or, you know, back in its origins in Spain and Italy. Yes, thank you for your comment. I think um, <laughs> if I further, well, when I further work on this project, I can consider um, either raising these buildings, introducing pilotes or, um, yeah, having more open spaces where the outdoor integrates with the indoor, which previously was trying, which I previously tried to bring into the project, but slowly went away um, as I redesigned. Brian, uh, this is John Fontellis. Can I jump in for a second? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Jocelyn, I, you know, I love, love, love the um, kind of uh, the law of the Indies uh, arrangement of your public square, the Plaza Mayor. Uh, twinned with that very commercial side of the Zocalo uh, uh, facing the city. And I love the Part T coming across the bridge and going out. I, I think that's, that's spot on. I do have a criticism. I, I, and I'm, maybe I'm not reading the drawings right, but um, you have on the left-hand side a square footage count for the, um, for the school yes. of 138,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. Is that all of the purple buildings uh, put together? Yes, that is the purple buildings um, with the floor plates of the buildings, not just the footprint. Um, okay. But it may be that I have to go back and recalculate. Well, no, it goes back to what the, the other critic uh, mentioned about uh, really scale. 
uh, mm -hmm. because I, I, I'm having a hard time squaring this with the, uh, uh, the imagery you showed at the beginning, you know, the Francis Carre school, uh, the size of that building with what mm -hmm. potentially you're building here is, you know, essentially, I just did a 700 auditorium, uh, capacity auditorium in Colorado Springs and it cost $60 million. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of, of this. And then when I look at your site plan, uh, if you pan over, uh, of the complex in the in the town, yeah, there on the right, the the site plan on the right, the big one. That there there are no buildings that are any size in in this this neighborhood are much smaller. So I'm, I'm having a hard time squaring what you said earlier about these sort of more handcrafted buildings built by mm -hmm. you know by the community. Looking at the the um, <clears throat> the sort of the texture of this town, and then imagine these giant you know, chunks of, of like elephant feet dropping down in the right. middle. Now, obviously it's an institution, you're talking a, a school for 700, it's a, the you know, community of three communities coming together to build this, I, I understand that. But, you know, the things that you were showing earlier were much more handcrafted, much more in scale with, I, I would think an agricultural community is, I think you may uh, be, you know, uh, reaching a little bit too high here mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of uh, an institution that would require immense resources uh, to right. build and to maintain, uh, unless you imagine this as being, you know, uh, the, th the three cities have together. I mean, uh, Brian is all, has told me about the story of Siena. You know, Siena is three communities that came together to build the uh, Palio. Right, the the grand, but I mean, essentially, it was a, a a means of bringing all three communities together, and in this case, I guess, all focused on education for their their children and their the next generation. So, right. uh, yeah, I, I'm just having a little hard time trying to understand if you really meant to have that more uh, community built feel from the original photographs, or if you're thinking of this as really being a civic gesture on the scale of, you know, uh, uh, bringing all these things together. Uh, right. Um, so once working on the building plans and the elevations, um, previously uh, working during the semester, I did have buildings that were much taller, but then, um, you know, it came to my attention and it was brought to my attention that these buildings were too tall to be built. So. I now that I have this um, iteration, um, the actual building is 30 feet high, and then the raised roof would give um, about like, I believe it was like 10 feet um, in height. So I guess personally, once I brought it down, um, to me, it made a bit more sense of the size in the scale of the buildings. But I think also, um, as Brian mentioned and others mentioned, maybe breaking down the buildings a bit more um, can give that expanded feel of the campus and also uh, a more promising structure being built by the community. So thank you for well, bringing that. In, in a way, I think it's interesting that you actually even drew the chicken coops and the other outbuildings. And I think it might be very interesting if you could even break down these buildings into their component parts Mm -hmm. So that you have a true, you know, village community of right. much smaller buildings, but then aggregated into these larger mm -hmm. uh, zocalos or plazas. So, I, you know, I think you're going the right direction. It's just, uh, you know, scale is always important, trying to understand right. the size of things. Yeah, during the semester, I think all of us were kind of struggling with the scale, um, really imagining what it is. <laughs> Thank you. Well, if there are not any further questions, uh, I'd like to add one thing and then introduce uh, Juan Burke, the chair of this committee, to come up. But I was just thinking, as John was talking, and, and certainly the, the scale of construction here, it sounds like you have to hire, you know, Gilbane or some large uh, firm to come in and do it. It doesn't look yet like it's something that the locals would do. Uh, but also the 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 this, the idea of this auditorium space. I, I want to just plant in your head um, the auditorium space. If it does become the heart of the library, then 
I would recommend that it be more like the space that we're currently in, the great space here at the School of Architecture, which has a flat floor and is entirely flexible and can be used for a variety of different activities versus a sloped floor like our auditorium, which is not as flexible and can only be used for sort of, you know, the sage on the stage and the audience kind of uh, venue. Uh, I'd like to have Juan come up and uh, conclude the presentation. Professor Burke. Thank you, Brian. Um, well, just to wrap up this uh, interesting conversation and to uh, end with uh, a couple of uh, notes about Jocelyn's project. Um, when she came to me and told me that she wanted to work uh, with Yanga, uh, I'm, I'm a Mexican uh, myself, um, and Yanga is a, is a town that has been forgotten by the official history books. It's a really exciting, if you think about it, uh, it's a town founded by a series of runaway slaves that challenged the, the Spanish Empire at the height of, uh, of its power. Um, and so this is a town that, even though it's not in, mentioned so much in the history books, it does sort of linger or exist in the minds of, of many Mexicans. And Gaspar Yanga is a, is a symbol of uh, persistence and uh, uh, a search for freedom. And Jocelyn has uh, family roots there. So I, I found it extremely interesting um, to work with her on, on this. And um, there are many challenges, to, 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 to be honest, uh, thinking about uh, an architecture that would be dignified, that would be monumental for a town that has been disenfranchised uh, from its roots, from its beginning, uh, tackling the idea of, of scale, as, as it was pointed out. Uh, but I, I'd like to think that um, it, is, it, it would be possible to, to build something like this. There are precedents uh, in, in Mexico right now in which the government participates also in, in the sponsoring of uh, projects that can reach the this, this scale, but yeah, it is, it is a, a valid critique to, to recalibrate, revise the, the scale. Um, so anyway, um, Jocelyn, you, you uh, surmounted a lot of hurdles. Uh, she lost her laptop uh, with all of the information in it. <laughs> so this is a project that was uh, redone. It was, it was done twice, kind of. <laughs> So I'd like to, to commend you for that. Um, it was, it was, uh, she was very receptive to, to my critiques, to Professor Kellis. So uh, it was very fun to, to work with you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, folks. We're gonna take about a five minute break here to retool things here. For those of you back at home or back at work, if you need a moment to stand up to check your, your uh, iPhones, we're gonna start at the top of the hour uh, with the third and final presentation for this morning. <laughs> it was great. No tears. I was crying before this.
and uh, hopefully our our guests are all back. They seem to have their cameras off, but they uh, they can't hear me because I have us shut off. There we go. Okay, folks. Welcome our guests back uh, again online. Hopefully they'll they'll pop into here in a moment. Um, there we go, John. You and G. I'll bet you Arena is going to be next, and so on he, and then we'll be ready to roll here. So, to, so the first two theses focused on issues of rethinking educational models. The, the next several theses will be looking at urban infrastructure and how to either adapt or to rethink urban infrastructures so that they're more sustainable um, and more resilient and more humane infrastructures. Bobby will be presenting today her uh, thesis uh, at a location that's not too far from here in uh, Greenville in um, uh, East Riverdale, Maryland. Uh, her committee was Peter Noonan um, and Ariel Bierbaum. And I will note that uh, Bobby is a dual degree student. She's getting both a Master of Architecture and a Master of Community Planning, which is uh, one of the great unique uh, advantages of attending University of Maryland. So without any further ado, Bobby, it's all yours. Thank you, Brian. So, um, Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this th thesis presentation where we explore urbanism in the suburbs of East Riverdale, Maryland, inspired by sustainable community action. A special shout out goes to my committee uh, members, um, as well as my family for enduring me for the past six months and um, helping me come to this point uh, in my graduation. Scrolling. Did you break that? No. Nope. You broke it already? <laughs> Sorry. Small technical issue. Yeah, okay, great. Thank See, you. it takes just that magic finger. Throughout this presentation, we will talk about the site and its context, urban agriculture as a growing necessity, evolution of program. And then we will move on to design development and have some time for feedback and questions. This thesis is situated in East Riverdale in Prince George's County, Maryland, a suburb on the outskirts of Washington, DC, a suburb through which the proposed Purple Line rail system has been designed in order to better connect to other prominent neighborhoods around it. Its proximity to the city of DC makes it important especially for those residents that can no longer afford to live in the city due to rising costs. A hotspot for daily commuters, the 34-acre site is bound by East-West Highway 410, which leads to the main Baltimore-Washington Parkway that gets you to DC and Baltimore, and 201 Kenilworth Avenue. The aerial view on this slide shows the partially constructed purple line. It runs through the site at an elevated um, level, allowing for cars to pass into the site underneath. The purple line coalition has also designed the landscape surrounding the tracks to include a vegetated buffer to reduce noise. The existing buildings on site are mostly commercial single-story single um, structures that were built in the 60s. They house a small variety of basic amenities like banks and grocery stores that serve the immediate um, resident population around, it, around them. There are also some religious and community institutions adjacent shown in blue. Most of the site, however, is taken up by large amounts of surface parking as is characteristic of suburban sprawl. The two zoning maps here show the changes in zoning brought about by the Purple Line development. The image on the right shows the zoning that currently exists on site, with areas largely being zoned single and multifamily use, as well as commercial shopping centers. However, the image on the left um, it shows the more inclusively zoned site as a neighborhood activity center. 
as is required for mi mixed-use development these days. This is characterized by an increase in density, reduced parking requirements, and an addition of tax credits for activities like urban agriculture and small-scale businesses. A larger look at the site context shows us other prominent amenities that become essential to the community in terms of schools, green spaces, and transit. The site is about a 10 minute walk from the mark station shown in blue on the, on the image that takes residents to Baltimore as well as DC downtowns. Additionally, the site is also close to the Northeast Paint Branch Trail off the Anacostia River, which offers abundant space for outdoor recreational activities like biking, running, and more. Demographic studies uh, show us that most residents in the area are middle to low income families that work blue collar or service sector jobs. About 10% of the population is unemployed and families can either afford a single car or rely on public transportation. Through planning efforts in the last five years, the community voices have been recorded as asking for change in the area. When we define change, they talk about affordable housing, increased connectivity to surrounding amenities, and a general increase in quality of life. Residents want their community to become more interesting and engaging, and they're also concerned about the loss of character that existing neighborhoods would face with the onset of development brought in by the Purple Line. A few pictures taken through the site shows the existing planning of the area which largely accommodates automobile traffic over pedestrian activity. Dilapidated and dated development, a lack of community-defined space for activity, and reduced commercial and retail activity. Another major issue that is being battled by Prince George's County, is, where the site is located, is food insecurity. The image to the left shows a food proximity diagram that maps attainable distances to grocery stores in the area. The site has a small grocery store that's circled in um, red that caters to some of the local population, and its removal would actually result in the creation of a food desert, making it an essential in program. This brings us to the crux of the thesis argument. The analysis of the site has shown a necessity for increase in economic, environmental, societal, and spatial relevance, and incorporating urban agriculture can do just that. Urban agriculture has become an environmental necessity to provide food for the large city populations that exist today. It can be a flexible alternative to increase income, has health benefits involved with exercise and green spaces, can provide skill building and educational opportunities for surrounding schools and residents, and increase food security in the area coupled with other measures. It also allows people to connect better with the idea of healthy eating and is an asset to the surrounding society. Urban agriculture can be practiced in different levels, from an individual to an agrihood society and residents can gain unitary as well as collective benefits from a range of activities. These include and are not limited to home gardens, community gardens, school farms, self-harvest gardens, all of which promote the local community socially and economically. Apart from different levels of green space, the evolving program also looks at incorporating a grocery store, commercial and retail space for small businesses and community amenities, affordable re rental housing, and a wide variety of home, opportunity, uh, home ownership opportunities for local residents. An initial step taken was to analyze the fabric, the urban fabric that was characterized by sprawl and repair it to facilitate more mixed-use development. The existing street fabric was largely disjointed with long connections that primarily was prevalent for automobile users. Joining existing streets to create more walkable blocks of about 800 to 1,000 feet in perimeter um, and improving connectivity across the two sides of Riverdale Road as well as the surrounding amenities was, uh, became, was the way for us to weave a more sustainable urban fabric. Special consideration was given to daylight the Greenvale stream that passes through the, Anacost through to the Anacostia River. 
The stream was previously covered up by impervious surface parking. The first step towards development of a master plan was to insert these walkable blocks on the site. The second was to create a valley that incorporated the Greenvale stream and acted as the spine of the plan. Malleable blocks further defined this central space by, um, like by curving along the spine. So um, location and orientation played an important role as southbound walls were reduced or illuminated to allow optimal uh, sunlight for community agricultural activities that would take place. And so all these steps kind of created this basic massing model to which program could then be added. As programmatic elements, both built and landscaped were added. Special care was taken to ensure that the surrounding communities would be integrated in a, man that, in a manner that was as non-disruptive as possible. The master plan highlights the several block communities that have evolved as a result, oh, sorry, that evolved as a result of this process. The central urban agricultural spine is highlighted as flowing along with the river and connecting to the local Browning, uh, Browning's Grove Park, frequented by students and residents. Community activities take place in small buildings that are adjacent to the spine. A plaza was created at an upper level um, to allow residents and visitors coming in from the Purple Line to seamlessly experience the site as they disembark from uh, the light rail and they can also easily access the grocery and other commercial and retail spaces surrounding the site. The plan incorporates various speeds of automobile traffic based on traffic requirements and pedestrian safety. Greenwheel Parkway which is the dotted, the dashed blue line that go, goes across the site, was designed to incorporate low speed traffic in order to allow drivers to experience the more romantic views that were offered by the curve. The road also directly connects to Baltimore Washington Parkway. Bike lanes were introduced both within the spine and adjacent to the purple line. The purpose of the inner lane through the spine was to facilitate recreational biking and connect the school um, to the site, creating a safer and easier connection. Retail edges are concentrated on the northwest um, corner of the site closest to the Purple Line station. And they uh, progressively feather down in intensity as we get to the suburban com communities that outline the site. This has been done to actually protect the privacy of residents and reduce traffic in order to promote increasing pedestrian activity and movements throughout the site. The Greenvale stream flows from east to west, culminating in the northeast branch of the Anacostia River. The site actually slopes accordingly, putting the eastern half of the site at risk of floods from the 100-year rains. The valley has been designed in such a way that it provides adequate space for the area to flood, keeping water away from the residents and the rest of the space. This um, section further kind of elaborates on the central agricultural space and the details incorporated in it. Reeds and rocks on either side of um, the stream kind of filter the water before it goes uh, down and recharges uh, the groundwater resources. And on either side of the stream, you see um, flood resistant food gardens that are designed to trap embankment soil when water levels rise. Um, these are mostly like uh, fruit and vegetable plants like um, corn, cover crops, sugar beets. They're all planted in the bottom near the river. And then as you go up with less risk of flooding, you have uh, increasingly veg vegetable and fruit plants that um, serve the community. In the event of floods, um, this also helps filter back water into the ground because of its impervious, because of its pervious nature. An overall view of the longitudinal and transverse transects across the site show massing considerations as a part of design. The edges of the site have buildings that are lower uh, in height to blend in with the surroundings, while the central buildings are taller to incorporate maximum density as is characteristic of transit-oriented development. These transects focus on the heavily commercial and retail-oriented part of the site, showing the connection 
between the station, the upper plaza, um, the grocery store, uh, some condos above the grocery store, and commercial offices um, highlighted in blue. Uh, parking has been provided in the basement with few reserved spot, uh, spots above for like short stops. This is a broader view of the whole um, uh, uh, commercial and retail area, where it shows the true mixed-use nature of the site, where you also see plaza users look, looking out into the urban farms and um, you know farmers working in the fields um, on like part-time or whatever they want to, and then they, you know, they can kind of go into the cafe, get a get a cool drink while having like this beautiful greenery in front of them. So you kind of combine this mixed-use idea of um, of the of the site and you also have like workers who work um, retail and commercial sector jobs coming out during their lunch breaks and just enjoying um, a lot of the the scenery the next part of the transect focuses on residential activity um, showing the various interactions that residents have with the street community sensory farms that exist in the center of every community as well as, as, well as like balconies and roof gardens um, and the inter interactions that happen there um, 4.7 acres is the rough ground cover agriculture that you see throughout the, the uh, project and you also get another three acres of uh, vertical greenhouses and um, rooftop gardens and that would provide um, the agricultural needs of at least 50% of um, the families within the site in terms of healthy food and have surplus for the rest of the community. The community farms um, situated within the blocks double up as recreational spots for the residents with sensory plants. So they can form heritage gardens, exotic gardens, and like sensory gardens with uh, appropriate plants that provide recreational spots. So an example of this would be like a, a, a herb garden, which kind of has this, the sense of smell, the sense of like taste, where they can just walk through and they flower differently, allowing for bees to also create, um, you know, different flavors of honey. The buildings, um, yeah, the buildings have programmatic elements incorporated into them that best support all benefits from individual to collective. The materiality of the buildings was further explored with two primary materials that made up the facades. So facades that that kind of face um, the inner spine of the valley were um, largely um, wood-based emphasizing the sustainable nature of um, the space, while the outer facades uh, facing away from the valley were largely brick so that they could blend in with the surrounding communities and not create too much of character shock. Pedestrian safety has been in ensured throughout the site with emphasis on green sidewalks and separate lanes buffered from vehicular traffic. A view of the space between the station and the commercial um, plaza shows the emphasis of design on pedestrian activity and multimodal green transit options for residents and visitors. The crux of this thesis is essentially to create a sustainable mixed use development that improves the quality of life of uh, new and old residents while acting as a transit oriented development. So increased density. What was once a disinvested space that was planned for automobiles and propagating sprawl with a lack of community programming um, has the potential to transform. It can transform into a space that prioritizes people and experience, elevating community health and celebrating life. Um, thank you um, so much for listening. And I would definitely like to open up the podium for any questions or, and or comments that you may have. Thank you so much. A terrific presentation, Bobby. Questions about the, the, the public agricult the agricultural spaces. The ones on the south side seem to be in courtyards. And the ones on the north, and I apologize if, I, if you said this, I missed it, those seem not to be in courtyards. Is there a different level of access in terms of management for those? Can anybody go into the ones on the north, whereas the ones on the south are more building specific? So, so the ones on the south are more geared towards the people that surround it. Yeah. Would you like the microphone back to answer this question? Yeah. So, um, 
the, the way the agricultural communities were planned is that this, wait, let me just move. Yeah, okay. So the central courtyard spaces are largely, um, are largely for community, um, community residents that live in the buildings. So if you've noticed that most of these spaces don't actually have retail in the base so that there would be no necessity for people to come in um, to those gardens unless they had something to do or they wanted to enjoy the gardens. Um, but most of the agricultural um, crop and public view is only the spine in the middle and the rest of them are uh, managed by the communities but the spine in the middle would be so the idea of management of these agricultural communities would be um opened up to a third person party like seed which is a growing organization that manages um agricultural um agri hoods like this along with community members just so they can get their footing and then communities generally organize amongst themselves where they focus like a, a management plan just to clarify then so the ones on the on the south side are less open to the public but if i'm walking along that road along the edge of the of the stream valley i could walk right into one of those like in there that would be totally open and whatever's planted there i'm walking by one day and i see something i could pick it and, and no one would come out and yell at me or anything like that okay okay all right that's helpful thanks um so another thing about the idea of these gardens is that it's if you if you feel so inclined to pick it it's because you have need of it and, um, you know, otherwise, the whole idea of all of the communities focusing in on that central spine means that you have like eyes on the street. And so unless you really want it, you won't pick it. Um, are there any questions online? Um, yeah, Irina. Okay. Uh, thank you for a very detailed, very thoughtful uh, analytical approach to something that uh, will bring uh, different life to Riverdale community. I wish you can get this built. <laughs> I know the neighborhood very well. Uh, so uh, the effort that you put in, the thought that you put in uh, is uh, outstanding. Um, I would like to encourage you and offer a suggestion. Uh, the thoughts that you embedded for health promoting uh, type of environments and the way you planned very carefully an urban setting that has all the uh, positive characteristics of misuse development, I believe you can take to the actual massing and bl blending of the typologies of the residential units. It appears to me that you kind of stopped yourself and you repackaged existing paradigms. And I believe your approach and how we design communities these days, transit-oriented uh, communities, will benefit from us rethinking the way different typologies that are tied to affordability can work. For example, there is nothing wrong in blending um, townhouse units with an actual mid-rise level residential structure. So you have different income levels that can coexist in the same environment. It actually creates a plant and it creates an opportunity for creating a community interaction in a different level. Uh, think along the lines of row housing. Yes, by definition, it's called row housing, but it does not have to be laid out as such. I personally have chosen to live in a townhome for the sense of community and the sense of connectivity. Think along the lines of how you can actually create communal type of living there are some examples in the city that actually can offer you ideas and related to that i will recommend when you look at translating your ideas of planning into the actual massing try to subtract a little bit more so you can really create this cohesion of indoor outdoor at different levels i know it's very easy we look at rooftop gardens and rooftop terraces, but you can actually create pockets of that experience in the intermediate level. And then you have a true fusion of all these components of true indoor, outdoor uh, urban existence. Uh, there is a, a, a great little pocket of infill residential development completed in 2012 in Montpellier. 
uh, it's called the Rubis development, and it features these uh, extraordinary uh, extended terraces that allow uh, tenants and users of these spaces, the residents to actually truly be outdoor and yet as part of their unit. Uh, and I saw that you had described this, but I think you you need to push yourself and, and get both the massing and the approach to residential living to that level. But extraordinary presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irina. Um, I definitely um, struggled with the limits of this project because of the time frame. And I would have loved to go in deeper and work on the typologies a lot more than I did. And your comments are absolutely valid. It's what I have in the vision um, for these, um, for this community, um, you know, to be one as a community. That's why um, I try to design mostly um, Co uh, like condominiums and restrict the townhouses just for scale um, so that it would facilitate, um, uh, you know, so a, like a block has condominiums as well as um, rental um, apartments so that, you know, people can mix and it's not just like, okay, I own a home here, so I have stakes in this, but I also rent here, so I still have stakes in the community. And so it kind of gives like this equal opportunity to anyone living um, in this community rather than just picking those who have money um, physically invested in it. Thank you. Blend them economically, it works, it's being already executed in a lot of places, so you can see the data from the success of it. But Absolutely. Really work. Thank you so much. Oh, so that, okay. Um, so the, let me, okay, how do I, um, Brian, how do I go to my board? Do I stop sharing? Not familiar with a MacBook. Don't mind me. You guys can't see me. Oh, oh my goodness, how do you zoom in this? Okay, um, so the question was, what is um, this block <laughs> on the East Riverdale Plaza? And to answer that, I will not do that. Uh, okay. Um, so that is actually this block um, that's adjacent to the grocery store and the purpose of that is to be a beacon to the community that highlights um, the space. Um, so it has the East Riverdale Plaza on it. But the secondary internal pr purpose is that it's actually vertical transit to transport you up to the garden space that's shared by the luxury gondos above. So you can actually see the site from a higher view and um, like all the way down. And the the facade is mostly designed as wood, um, as explained um, in the presentation, uh, to promote this idea of everything being natural um, to sight and touch. So you have like green walls um, on the brick behind it, and then you have like the wooden structure. Then as you come in forward, you have the, the farms. Bobby, John here, if I may. Um, I, I'm very interested in this idea where you've actually put the, the urban uh, uh, farm, as it were, <clears throat> in the most natural part of the, the site, you know, this sort of Olmsteadian uh, flowing green space that you've actually daylighted, but then you're imposing upon it uh, the most uh, 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 kind of active human intervention of, of putting agriculture on it. And I was just wondering, that's obviously a choice you've made, but I, I noticed that you've also shown the roof areas is all green. And to me, it seems that that might be, frankly, a more appropriate place to put the urban agriculture, urban farm, which are typically, you know, very long rows and furrows because you're trying to get more efficiency out of the planting. So you want it to be something that's more rectilinear, more kind of active so you can plant them and control the agriculture as opposed to putting in a place that, you know, quite honestly might flood every hundred years or, you know, given our climate change may <laughs> flood every 10 years or so. And again, I, I'm just very interested in the choice because uh, it, it, it sort of goes against what I would think uh, would be sort of the natural uh, realm. 
and goes back to this other question of how does one create those levels of publicness versus privateness in terms of the agriculture and the planting, the landscape, which is as much as a, a, a continuum as the public space of the, of the, of the transit station to the private houses uh, along the way. So can you talk a little bit about what, what made you move to this uh, decision versus others? Thank you so much for your question. Um, so th this was actually a really interesting and um, choice that I had to make. And one of the reasons of why we decided to keep um, both levels agricultural is because of uh, the density of this kind of transit oriented development. And if, I, if we wanted to grow enough agriculture to support these communities, then we would need all the space we get because it is after all a growing urban um, uh, development. Um, there is a lot of difference in the crops, however, grown um, in the ground as well as on the roof. The roof farms will definitely be more intensive. There are greenhouses that would incorporate ver vertical farming of uh, more uh, like uncooked uh, foods like salads and um, really uh, robust like fruits and vegetables, whereas the ground the ground level would actually be used as um, crop cover, um, uh, corn, um, things that actually need that kind of space to grow, but is only available um, in rural areas. The other idea that, you know, came about when we were thinking about this was um, what makes you know, an Olmstedian um, landscape, Olmstedian. It's, why is, why can we not integrate agricultural crop as something that is less functional, like not less functional, but functional, but also beautiful and also something that can be explored um, by touch, by feel, by actually having this feel of walking through food. Because in today's generation, there is such an increasing um, disconnect between how food is grown and how it arrives at the grocery supermarket. And that is something that, you know, when you have schools close by and you have children close by, you want to inculcate at a very young age so that they understand the process. They know that something as fundamental as food is coming through these processes. And that's why you need to eat it or that's why it's healthy for you to, um, you know, have this kind of a lifestyle. And so if I only elevate it to rooftops, um, then that's not going to be seen by anyone apart from the residents that live particularly in those communities. And so it's kind of a choice and a decision that I made to, um, I mean, well, the fine, like the fine tuning would definitely have to be done when we get down to the nitty gritties of it. But for the overarching idea, I definitely wanted it to be accessible um, to the communities and not isolated just by access. I think that is the perfect answer <laughs> in its sort of defensive and thesis. And uh, honestly, I think it also feeds into what you said earlier. You know, your Jane Jacobs quote of having eyes on the street. I think you flipped it completely on its head, eyes on the on the plants, uh, which I think Jane would be very uh, impressed as well. So uh, thank you so much. Kudos to you. So I have a I have a question. Um, along with what John was mentioned. And I, I think this is fantastic idea of um, like a, the, the engaging and, and so the two things, um, the functional and beautiful and engaging, that is kind of the heart and heat of the center of your thesis and I love it. And the other one is um, like a, the experiential learning that whether it is growing uh, as a as a child or the people, um, regardless of your um, the age or your experience, by looking by engaging, that is kind of the um, your experience and then the learning and then you know that you capture the value. Um, my question is because it's not the uh, beautiful green space in between. So your thesis is urban agriculture. So I'm just going to dive in a little bit about the growing part, the agriculture part of it. Um, and it was mentioned that there is a the intense growing season. So the you know the, the sunlight um, and then the temperature and the water and the soil restoration and all those kind of things is really, really important to make this um, happen. So I, wa I, I would like to hear a little bit about your journey to understanding the agriculture part, how much of that was part of your thesis 
And then second is knowing the, the climate we are in, um, the, maybe your rendering is the best season to look at, but we have a four season that whether where there is no ground cover with the greenery, it is just the, you know, the browns or maybe like on tilt, maybe something is fermenting underneath. So smell is not as great, but you kind of see the future that gonna be really, really fertile ground for the grow. So I wanna hear a little bit about how you are incorporating this four different seasons or even like a different aspect of the beauty that comes with the agriculture. What was your thought um, putting that into the center of the community and how does that gonna be um, perceived? Thank you so much for your question. So that's actually something that's really interesting that I did research quite a bit in um, uh, before I started developing this because um, we experience a pretty, um, you know, um, solid winter in Maryland um, where we have like snow and everything. Um, when a lot of these ground crops are also used as cover crops. And so when um, in an agricultural society, when they cut the cover crop, they cut it in sheaves and they lay it in like a crisscross way. And so that's really beautiful to look at. Um, that commences from um, end of like fall to early spring before they again um, till the soil and create rows to seed, which is also a really beautiful uh, experience. And so um, the space that is created in between has a lot of seasonal changes that happen to it, which is all part of like the experience, experiential education um, that people will see and understand and know that you know this is what happens at different seasons and this is all a part of the agriculture. So you're bringing that knowledge to the public, but it also has its own intrinsic beauty that um, should be considered beautiful. I mean, it's not just the green uh, leaves of the plants that really have the beauty, but also when the leaves fall and you see um, these um, you know, wooden branches silhouetted against the brick or the wood. That's also a, a beauty of its own. When snow falls on the tops of all of these um, branches, it's it's got its own beauty. So the idea celebrates agriculture at different stages of agriculture um, and not just in spring. I. Uh, it's, it, I haven't shown, I, I, do, I do agree uh, to your point of not having shown those in my thesis boards. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, if I had more time, I would definitely be able to show all the seasonal changes and get the same point across as I did with just this one season. Um, Bobby, this is really wonderful and impressive. And, you know, I have to say, we just did this site in Architecture 700 this fall, and it is much more difficult than, than anyone who listened to your presentation would be led on to believe, because you've made it you, you've made it clear and simple. And there are three things that are very difficult about this site. One is that the trans elevated transit line is up against the road and has a very odd relationship to the site, and it's way up there too, number one. So the grade change from grade up to the station level is quite, it's like three stories, right? Secondly, the stream running through it, which obviously needs to be dealt with, and, and you can see in your isometric that the stream actually runs into the backyards of neighborhoods and things down there, so you can imagine what sort of trouble it causes you know, for the homeowners in that area. And the third thing is there's a quite a bit of topography on this site, particularly where the shopping center currently is located. It really bombs uphill, and so dealing with that is really a, 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 a real challenge. And you know, of the three sites we did this fall, this was by far the most challenging. I have a couple of comments about the scheme, which I think in general, in general does all the things it should do, but just some detailed things that I think are probably could be a little bit stronger. Um, one is, I, th I think I believe the south side with the, with the agriculture in the courtyards, and there's a sort of scale relationship of those courtyards to the buildings, and the sense of privacy and ownership of that space for the agriculture there. On the north side, I think you're kind of giving mixed signals because I can't really tell if those are meant to be more courtyards of buildings or open spaces. In actual fact, I think the definition of the path along that edge from the residential neighborhood uphill down to the station is could be much strong, much more well-defined. Right now, the ends of the buildings do it, and maybe that's okay because of the south-facing courtyards, 
but one wonders, well, you know, what other things begin to define that path? Is it trees? Is it landscape elements, low walls, and things like that to begin to give a sense of what's public, what's semi-public, what's private, what's semi-private, and all those layers that make up a good kind of relationship of buildings to streets. And I think those things could, could on the northern side, could be a lot stronger. The other, th the two other comments that I have that I think are probably things I would want to reconsider. I don't know that I would have put those shapey, curvy um, community amenities in the park, in the agricultural park. I might have put them in the base of buildings, so that so that they could just be more simply accommodated. You know, and each building might have a different community use. It just would give you more room for agriculture and stuff there, which is, I think, probably a better use in that space than than the than the round thing and the banana thing and the thing with the curved edge. You know, I think those things are probably don't want to be in that space. I think they're going to be more easily accommodated in the ground level of those things. And then the last thing is about the plaza and stuff, which I think is I love the grocery store and all the layering and the compounding of uses there. That's all pretty nice. I do think. The, the big tower with the blank walls. I know you have to get elevators in and disabled access and stuff, but that would be a really wonderful place to inhabit beyond the corner there, whether it was residential or office or whatever, that you could look down on the plaza and you could look out over the green space and you could see the whole thing. And maybe that's a community building and or community rooms on each floor for the residential or something. It just seems like too important of a location in particular in this perspective to give over to um, just sort of functional stuff. You know, it, it really is a real real estate opportunity that I think could be quite quite extraordinary. I think the 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 scale at which all particularly these sections, the careful drawing of the sections and the way these all work and the typologies and even the blow up of the the stream valley for the flooding and things like that, the 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 scale and detail of considerations embraced by you in this project is really nice and really impressive and succeeds in a nice way. I just, I don't know if urban, you know, you say, well, people would take food if they need them and things, which I think is a very idealistic thing. And I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, I, I guess, I, I, my guess is for it really to succeed, there would have to be a very, very clear and robust and well thought out management plan for how to make this stuff prosper, stay healthy, so that it isn't being picked over in ways that are bad for the community and things like that. Um, but you know, that's not obviously not necessarily what your thesis is about, but it's it's a really interesting idea, a different take on transit oriented development, you know, transit and food oriented development, I suppose. Is there a, it's a T O F D, <laughs> T O F T O F A. Um I'd like to build on some of um, Matthew's points. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of your presentation. So if I am stepping into something you've already said, then tell me and we'll move on. Um, this too is an area of the community I've been working with in the last two years. And I wish I had known you were working on this site because we, we should have talked. I've been working with the Central Kenilworth Avenue Redevelopment, CDC. Um, and one of the things that they've developed is I put a link into it is the Sarvis Cafe, which is the Sarvis Empowerment Cafe. Did you talk about that at all? No, I did not. So the whole idea that it's working with the School of Public Health, it's about to open next week. It's supported by the Kaiser family. Um, it's the Kaiser init you know, health initiatives and the intent. I mean, this community has between 60, 70, um, pe you know, people from 60 or 70 different countries. And so that's all about food. It's all about give, providing jobs for people to learn about getting jobs higher than, you know, a line chef and also about sharing the different food cultures. Um, and one of the things our studio did two years ago was create a dispersed community center because there is not one that included a mobile food truck um, that brought produce from a farm that's actually nearby. Um, and help to deliver the food from the service cafe. So I think the notion of thinking about, and also last year we worked with all the local international restaurants and the spaces around it and the tagline was traveling without travel. Um, so I think that thinking about food and thinking about agriculture and also um, the opportunities for uh, thinking about green space in this way may resonate well with many of the inhabitants. I do also wonder about who cares for this and how that's structured. 
and whether there's almost too much of the agricultural area. And if it was perhaps smaller plots and you know part of it was community gardens, that could also be responsive to the kinds of foods that someone from um, Africa, or Kenya, or someone from um, Malaysia or someone, whatever, which you may have spoken about. Um, what I, what I, I and I, it feels like there's not a lot of space. We had a student look at this for actually playing along that path. There's a linear path and there's agriculture and I would like to see that path create places for being. And then the last point I'd say is if we look at your axon, um, I think just with a few extra um, drawing, I would like one of the challenges also is crossing Kenilworth Avenue and connecting to the businesses on the other side. And if you, you know, simply, I don't know if I can annotate and you could see it, but you thought about how we get, you know, to this part and support these businesses as well, um, as well as these businesses here, there's a farmer's market that currently happens. Um, I think that could go a long way into showing how this is, you know, part of a larger network um, and the bike paths that are being planned, et cetera. Um, and then I noticed in your program on the ground floor, very few were restaurants. And part of what is here is a lot of mom and pop restaurants, at least a hundred, right? But they're suffering right now. So I may have, you may have said all this. So I apologize if I repeat it. Um, no, that, that's that, uh, thank you so much for all your comments, um, Professor Bell, as well as uh, Professor Nysmuk. And I'm, uh, I would like to take this time to respond to a couple of um, the queries. A lot of uh, the points that were made about, um, you know, the uh, utility of space in terms of residential, I completely agree with. Um, the central spine um, has this, those um, community essential blocks placed there because um, through community um, meetings um, that I've read about, most of the people spoke about wanting open spaces that come out, uh, you know, that they can drive food trucks into or have stalls and um, just kind of um, be able to overlook some greenery, have the children's play in fields and do those kind of things. And so I, that's kind of why the placement of the center um, community buildings are there. So, you know, one person can use the gym and watch their kids just playing out in front. Sorry? Oh, okay. They're honestly, they're really small in square footage. And um, they are more for like the terrace that you can sit out and, you know, have lights on and just watch, like look at, look into the field. And so it kind of creates like these different levels of experiences that I feel um, kind of get overlooked when you talk about multifamily um, buildings and low cost affordable housing. And so I really just wanted to incorporate that for um, the community members to see and feel. I, I I guess I think there's a level at a smaller scale, right? That there's playgrounds and it actually goes back to Mariam's thesis about how we think about the range of people. So if I have a three to five year old, where's the playground? If, I have, if I'm an elder, is there a place to sit on these benches you know, along this path? Can I go into these fields when the corn is really high? Um, or is it always off limits? Like I grew up in a place in Manhattan that had green grass and as a kid, we were always yelled at when we went on the grass. So how do you start thinking? So these bigger spaces, and I, I agree with Matt that these are actually filling up the space, these buildings, these bigger gathering spaces, ha having those is a great idea, but there's another scale. And the question is when Matt's saying to do what, I think it's actually really valid and not to romanticize the idea of agriculture because it creates a green space where no one's allowed in. Um, because you might start during certain seasons and, you know, and so it's like a, it's, and that's, uh, means that the parents are all going to be yelling at their kids, don't go in. And that becomes a stressful thing as opposed to a relaxing thing. So that's the thing I, I think, you know, getting your head around at that scale might, might help. No, I completely understand. I think that's my fault for not annotating, but I did have spaces that were planned um, for other activities like 
um, the small green space that I'm showing you is just grass. It's just lawn for kids to play and it's not near any major road so that you know they can just play effectively. This is like a more paved space that people can sit outside with like tables and so I understand a lot of this has not been um, detailed at like a, a more scale. And I do wish I had more time to do that but um, there are some small pockets, um, the, the lawn here, the lawn here, um, some of the spaces in between the row houses. Uh, you know this this uh, small green park so i have tried to give like much smaller pockets for um especially considering children because it's so close to a school district but i i realize that it can really be broken down a lot more and that's something that i wish um you know i had this review like a month back to go back and like really um change a lot of things that i have um done but uh so thank you so much for your comments um as for the management, um, there, is, there are a couple of programs that I have been researching, which I hope you will find in my uh, thesis document, that um, talk about how, um, you know, from grass, like grassroots community organizations like SEED that work with communities to establish um, a whole um, idea of uh, management and uh you know they they work with the communities to offer jobs to offer training as landscapers as our agriculturalists uh, as horticulturalists and so much more um and so um i hope you do uh, go into my thesis um to my document to, to read more about the research that i have done um, but i'm hoping that that will um work out with the site um maybe in the future this might become a community land trust uh, where everyone has a more invested um you know um idea of uh, what they expect from this um space but um yeah that's basically all i have to say that, that's an interesting sort of response you had i i think those one story things are sort of indications more of things that should be there, of your thinking, putting public, make, there's sort of more symbols of the desire for having public engagement in those places than they are designs at this point, which is fine. You know, I mean, you've designed quite a bit here, so that that's okay. I think I think the, um, the, the thing that I think where Renit was headed is an interesting thing to think about is if you, if you then started to think, well, how do I, if, if you designed it as a park, you would have one set of things, but it's an agricultural landscape. So how do you design that landscape for engagement with you know seniors and then young kids and things like that? That's a very interesting kind of problem. I mean, it's the sort of thing maybe somebody would do in an MLA thesis rather than an architecture thesis. But I, but I think the whole idea of that as a kind of agricultural landscape through the center and then these more discrete things is really an interesting take on, on really trying to bring the stuff very close to where people live. I think that the the actual paths to the station and things, you know, probably need a little bit more thought in terms of what I'm walking past and how the buildings engage it in the front door and things like that, so that that's more normalized. Because that's not going to change whether you have crops nearby or not, right? That has to work no matter what, whether whether you whether it's open space and playgrounds or courtyards or crops, that all has to work. That's my point simply. But it, very very nice. Love the color palette, by the way. Uh, it's such, it's such a beautiful project and I think that we're all kind of projecting into the future that you'll keep working on this. So I'll offer up just a few comments in that spirit. Um, one thing that really intrigues me about this community is that it's very much like some small towns that I know where there's a very urban uh, street going through the town and then things become less urban and then it backs up to the farms. So I love the idea of sidedness. And you sort of introduced that talking about different materials in the front and the back. But I think that that's where I would go next and really playing up this kind of agricultural back and thinking about how that road you've created might be the farm road. Uh, because I think that agriculture requires a certain amount of, you know, trucks coming in and out and so forth. So that's one thought. And then perhaps morphing the, the farm side of the buildings so that they're distinctly different in the way that some like great country houses have an urban front and then a kind of garden uh, facade. Um, so that's one thought. Uh, and it's kind of about transportation. It's about the other transportation. And then I'm thinking, since this really is 
you know, about the purple line. I mean, that's so important that, that people are envisioning what it's going to be like when the purple line stations are there. I just would have loved to see the train and to see something more than just that little sign about, uh, you know, the station there. I, I would have loved to see that kind of impact of the purple line visually on the community. And then um, just just like last last comment um, I, I grew up in a place where there was a lot of development but the old farms hadn't quite gone away yet and kids love you know kids want to go down and fall in the stream and go fishing and you know they want to be engaged with the the interesting stuff so not just like a nice lawn for kids but they they want they want ways to really get into the dirt and get into the water. And, uh, you know, it's it's a great experience that you're creating here for children. And I think that that would be another avenue when you put together your firm to, you know, make this truly happen. That's another avenue I would I would get the staff to work on. Kids want to see frogs and things like that. Right. Uh, I'm going to ask Peter Noonan to come up and to uh, sorry. Oh, did, okay. I didn't, I didn't know. Oh, okay. Well, very well. Yes, sir. You're, you're the you're the you're the chair. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, Bobby, thank you so much. This was tremendous, and this was a tremendous learning experience for me. This is the first dual degree thesis that I've sat on, and so I really appreciate being in conversation with you and my architecture colleagues. And I think actually this last bit of conversation is. Um, something that i had questions about but that i really appreciate is a challenge that you confronted which was the question of scale um, and as a dual degree in planning and architecture matt actually just mentioned maybe this is a landscape piece right there are some of the questions are that interstitial scale right and you had to figure out how to sort of travel between those scales with the kinds of questions I was asking you and then what peter and your other colleagues were um, and i think you did a really um interesting job thinking about connectivity um and thinking about um sort of the the not only the design but the community aspects um i think that one thing that you um sort of demonstrated in how you answered the questions but maybe doesn't come through in your boards is the level of research um, and depth of consideration that you gave across these issue areas that i know you did um and i you know hope the expect that the thesis document sort of has all of that that lives in it because it's so um, important. So, um, you know, I just I think it was I think it was really wonderful, as Maddie said, like sort of there's so many places you, you could take this if you continue um, to work on this. And I think the question um, of scale and multiple users giving the purple line are, are things you can consider. Um, and I just also want to elevate something given the kind of elephant in our collective room of this pandemic moment, which is that I actually think this kind of project and reconceptualizing what outdoor indoor living can can look like even in the context of a winter climate, which we don't normally think about. I know many of the precedents you looked at were in places like California, right, that this kind of makes sense in a way that we have to translate now. and both that environmental consideration i think is particularly timely um and also your upfront framing that's also on your board around how this this is an important kind of design concept that meets individuals meets community and meets society in terms of benefit and input that is the conundrum of sort of the public health crisis we're seeing and i just i really value that your piece in this moment so, so thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, uh, Bobby, thank you so much um, and the whole committee. This is the first, I've, I've been on many dual degree um, thesis committees. This is the first one with planning and it gives me new uh, um, insight and appreciation for for your discipline and what Bobby, Bobby brought to the project. I think Irina uh, kind of made a comment about this bridge between planning and massing and this idea of fusion that um, basically Bobby brought to this presentation today and, and um, was the scaffold for really great questions and, 
and debate and discussion and ideas about how to move the project forward. I agree with Matt, the site is very uh, tough and I think you, you handled it quite nicely. And so thank you so much and we are looking forward to the next things that you do. I, w I want to thank all of the, uh, the reviewers online for spending the morning with us. Uh, Yunji, uh, Sonhee, uh, Irina, and John, thank you all very much uh, for spending the morning. We'll be back again at 2 this afternoon. So if any of you suddenly go, boy, I have to get more of this stuff, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, John, say hello to my, my family up there in New York, will you? Take care, folks. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.